may I introduce the heavyweight champion of the world, indeed of planet Earth, Muhammad Ali. Who's the bravest, prettiest dude who talked to the people all the way through? Who's the finest they'll ever be? You've got to appease Muhammad Ali. Who's the greatest king of the world? As you see, Mohammed, we've gathered a few of our friends, and I think friends of yours, uh, here this afternoon. Uh, they're going to be asking know. you. I don't know. I see one fellow out there. Uh, Did you get an eight on the jaw when you see him? My friend, he knocked me down once. <laughs> We're going to come to that in a second. A lot of these guys have followed you all over the world, writing you about your fights. We've got one or two people from the show business world here, mm -hmm. and we've got some ladies too who are in the uh, business of journalism. Uh, they're going to ask you questions soon. But can I start by asking you uh, a few questions? I want to say first how much of a pleasure it is to see you back in London. And I know that you've said in the past that you regard Britain as your second home. Why is that? Well, when I say that, I really mean sports-wise because um, in many cases you can say Britain can be ranked as number one as far as supporting me is concerned. Uh, I know the boxing authorities and the people when Joe Frazier was recognized as champion and this Jimmy Ellis and, and the little hassles that I had there in the States, they just didn't pay no attention to them here and they recognized me as their champion, you know, people and called me uh, the people's champion and, and I had got a lot of support from here during the days of my Prussia and that's why I always say that about England. Do you regard them as your strongest fans in many ways? Well, you really can't say who's the strongest fans because I'm not the people. I don't know how certain people take it. Uh, one fan was so strong he got killed uh, after a few uh, my fight with Frazier, the second fight, arguing over idea. And so you really can't say who's much stronger than a man who's dead if he's still living. But I would say that uh, um, it's real debatable. Well, a lot of lot of real fans there. In I know you went up to Lancashire on one occasion, didn't you? And you had a lot of strong fans there. Oh, a lot of man. ladies who yeah, gave you a bit of a man. tough time, didn't yes, they? Yes, they did. <laughs> Tell us about it. Well, we went up to a supermarket market there and uh, thousands and thousands of people. This is Birmingham and Manchester and I just never saw so many people in one crowd and they were crushing each other and, and jumping out in front of the cars and could have got hurt and this is why I know they're sincere. Are you scared when you say that kind of thing? Well, it frightens you not because of my welfare, but you hate to see people, you know, crowding the stage, trying to get autographs, and you see somebody being squeezed, uh, uh, they're suffering in the crowd because too many people are behind them, and, and this worries you are. Somebody sticking their arm in a moving car and getting caught, and, and these type things, uh, falling in front of a car when we're in big crowds. We just left Zaire. I went back for a week. And we had about 300,000 people lined up from the airport in big crowds just all through the streets. And the drivers were like racing and excited. And little children and people falling, you know, under the front wheel of the car or in front of the car. And it was stopped just in time. And it would just kill me if because of me and people admiring me, I look back and see somebody bleeding of mm -hmm. squares half to death because they got caught in a crowd. And I feel guilty, you know, so this worries me. You've mentioned Zaya, you've mentioned this country, and of course you've mentioned your own country. Where do you think uh, you are at your happiest? And in what kind of company? When I met my happiest was, uh, was when I'm in Chicago with my three little girls and my boy and my wife in my mobile home somewhere on the highway eating hamburgers. No press and nobody around. Yeah, right. <laughs> you said that those three girls of yours are really quite dangerous, aren't they? Yeah, they What do you mean when you say that? Dangerous because they're pretty. And <laughs> when they get to be about, I imagine, 18 or 19, I'm going to be in trouble. Some fella told me the reason you have three girls and one boy is because you're going to be paid back for all the <laughs> wrong you've done. <laughs> but don't you think those, those kids, great kids that they are, uh, are going to have a problem uh, when they grow up because their father was the greatest of all time? Well, I think uh, it can present not a serious problem, but wherever you go, people will point to you and say this or that. But uh, if you keep quiet and don't publicize it, I'm sure that people really won't know who you are. And Joe Lewis's daughter was uh, about... Um, uh, was handling some job or core thing in Chicago and didn't nobody know it was his daughter until she really told somebody, you know, if you just keep it quiet. The way they handle themselves, right. really. Yeah. What did your mother want for you when you were a, a young lad, Mohammed? 
She just wanted me to, like all mothers, basically, to go to school, to get education, to stay out of trouble, stay out of bad gangs, and try to be somebody in life, that's all. Yeah. When did you know that you were the greatest? Well, uh, when, when, when did I know I was the greatest? Yeah. Let me see, I was born in 1942. <laughs> <laughs> no, when I was 12 years old, I figured I had a great chance of being a fighter. Yeah. When I was 12. You've had so many high spots in your career, in your life, I know that. And a lot of people think that your life is a very glamorous one, and you may think that's true too. But there must have been bad moments in your career and in your life, uh, Mohammed. Can well, you recall any? Well, ones? you know, the first Frazier fight, you know, I was off three and a half years. That was bad. And uh, over here, oh, a terrible moment in my life. Oh, <laughs> it was around 1963 when that Henry Cooper hit me. <laughs> He hit me with a left hook. That lick was so hard, it jarred my color friends in America. <laughs> Henry, let me bring you in on this one, because, in fact, if that bell hadn't sounded, do you think you could have nailed Mohammed in that round? Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> definitely. You know, he was gone. Was... <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, he was Henry, gone. come up. Can we have an action replay on you that? Trying to I start just want to know how it happened, actually. Come on. I can't give the white way now. <laughs> Henry now. still looks good, too. <laughs> You don't have no fat on or nothing. Show us how the no, I'll, I'll show you what I was doing. I was Very, in the corner. Come on. He was going backwards. Yeah, yeah, I was in the corner jamming. Oh, he's one of the good. And that was it. Yeah, man. <laughs> fast. He hit me so fast. He hit me before God got the news. <laughs> Come and sit down, man. Yeah. Good to have you, Henry. I know we have another fight. Henry looks here. like he can still fight so I'd if he wanted to. Introduce to you, if I know <laughs> Mohammed. His name is Len Harvey. He was one of the greatest British champions. He was a British champion at three different weights: middle, light, heavy, and heavy. In the 1930s and the early 40s, he fought at every single weight. Can I ask you, Len? Would you have fancied your chances in the same ring as Muhammad Ali? Oh, well, sure, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. thought I was the only cockiest fighter. <laughs> but let me ask you this. Would you prefer to fight the Muhammad Ali of the 1964s when uh, Henry fought him or the 1974 Muhammad Ali? Uh, I think, to be fair to myself, that uh, I would take the... the uh, the 60... The 64? 64, yes. You think you'd have had an easier task if you could have had an easier task I at all? I think that, uh, Amy, uh, <laughs> <laughs> won a lot of, you know, a lot of fights after that, and, and he, he began to get good just when it's time for him to, you know, pack up. I see. Ray, he, I know that you've got... You he wanted me then? when I was at my fastest, right? Right. <laughs> he must have been fast. <laughs> He was very fast. He was, he was? very fast. Yeah. Reg, come in. I know there's a question that uh, you want to put on at this point. Yes. I, I, I think Len could hold as good as you, Mohammed, which would have been very worrying. Now, I, I, you're, a bo you're, a, you're, you're a boxing, you're a boxing student, and uh, I wouldn't want to take you on in that field. But having, having Len, having said I'm a that, student. oh yes, you, you say you're a student and you're an expert. This is why you're world professor. Oh, exactly. <laughs> I bow to your superior knowledge at all times. You know that. Would the 1964 then Cassius Clay have beaten the present Muhammad Ali? One with the style and the speed and now the one with the weight and the strategy how would you have fought yourself then well they you know like people really they, they this is why they underestimated me they forgot about what i can do you know they got blind they talk about weight i went in there fighting george ran about 213 pounds and this was one pound heavier than Sonny Liston when i was hot in my prime i wasn't heavy i don't know why they keep saying weight and um uh, I would say that the moving and the dancing, I could still do that, man. Yeah, I didn't want to do that because I would have gotten too tired at the pace. I danced about one round. The first round, I kind of moved. And I was a little too tired for one round. And figuring out I had 14 more rounds to go, this pace I couldn't keep up. And I had to move three or four steps to his one because he was cutting the ring off pretty good. I was surprised he could corner me like he could. So I, if I'd kept that pace up at dancing for seven, eight rounds, I would have had to resort to roast some actual ex exhaustion and tiredness and then probably he would have got one through so I said I'm gonna lay on the ropes first and let him throw all the punches and if he don't have nothing too dangerous then I'll stay on the ropes and leave tire out and that's what he did but uh, that type style fighting um, the, the uh, as you say, Cash is clear, 64, would have won easy, the 64 style, because uh, I would have moved, I would have kept moving and laying on the ropes 
It wouldn't have bothered me like it did George because uh, if a man lays on the ropes, I'll just jab him and back off of him and, and I'll tag him. And if I'm really hitting him, I'll keep hitting him. But if I'm not landing, see, George didn't have enough sense to realize he was not landing. He just kept throwing and throwing and throwing, ran out of gas, or what you all call it, petrol, and there wasn't a station around nowhere to be filled. <laughs> see? So the first Cassius Clay doing the hopping and jumping would have beat that man on the rope style because I never would have came in hitting range. I stayed off. When did you decide upon those tactics? Before the fight? No, sir, no, sir. It's like, um, you know, I'm sure Henry will tell you, any fighter that knows what's happening, you really can't plan a fight when you're meeting a man you've never met before, right? You just have to get your tools ready. Here's a car stops on the highway. They call the AAA or whatever and say, my car's broke down. What it is, the lady, she don't know it's broke. Well, the man comes with all the tools and he come equipped to handle whatever the problem is. An astronaut goes into space and he pretends that something happens to the ship before he take off. He gets out and he works on it. He's not looking for something to happen, but it might happen. So I didn't know. I just had everything ready. Now, after the first round, being here with a top professional, a man so great, had so many knockouts, never been defeated, never been even scratched, I didn't know really how good he was. So I had to come in, actually a little nervous, and with everything ready. After one round of dancing, I found out that this would tire me out. So I would have to resort to ropes. I figured that out after the first round. So I said, I'm going to go to these ropes, and I'm going to let this man throw everything he can. Let him tire himself out. He might look like he's winning. And if he don't hurt me, I'm going to stay here. But if he should be as great as they say he is, if he hits as hard as they say he hit, when he hits you and breaks your arm, he knocked out Joe Frazier. I couldn't do it. Knocked out Ken Norton. He was a big, bad jab before the fight, you remember. Now, you remember that, don't you? Yeah, I do. How bad he was? <laughs> <laughs> they don't say that now. But you remember he was a real bad cat the other day, right? Don't forget that. Now, after I found out he didn't have it, I stayed there. But if he had had what I thought he had had or what they said he'd had, I'd have kept running, hoping I wouldn't get tired. Ken, you want to come back, I think, on yeah, that? Yeah, just a point, Mohammed. When we spoke about four hours after the fight in the bungalow and in Sully, you, you said that you'd suspected before the fight that, uh, that the man didn't like being hurt. Now, I know no one likes being hurt, but this had registered with you. He don't like even being hit. I mean, see, you must realize this. Here's what I told the press. I told you all everything just about what happened. I said, the man is a little too slow. The man is, though he has no class. The man throws a whole lot of wild punches when he's not tired. And once he's tired, he's going to be falling all over everybody, like I told you. I told you that the man is never really being hit hard. And after he hears the man say, round four, Round five. He's only heard the man say round three in the last five or six years at the most. <laughs> round six. <laughs> round seven. <laughs> round eight. He said, what's happening? You understand? Then to have a man, I told you, constantly hitting him, I was telling you. That was right. And he constantly feel that. This is going to frustrate him. You understand? And to have a man that he can't knock out real quick. I said, this man has never been experienced. Joe Frazier was a little fat that night, got hit with some freak punch, and he never had a chance to show what he could do, and Fulman didn't have a chance to really show us what he could do. Norton got hit too quick to really see what he could do after he got tired and winded. Joe King Roman, and that's all he had was Frazier, Norton and Roman, and all of a sudden, he's one of the greatest of all times. I said, you all are wrong. This man is nothing. I'm the greatest of all times. Do you, are you crazy? This will be no match. The kid's, he's a kid. Wasn't I right? <laughs> Mohammed, I know that Reggie's got a point to make about the way that you fought that fight and the kind of uh, problems that referees might have with the way you, uh, <clears throat> tactics you adopted there. Yeah, there are some European referees, Mohammed, who say you're wrestling and hanging on a bit too much, or razzling, as you say with the States. Would you be worried with a European referee at the threat of disqualification if you were holding on too much? Yes, I'd be worried, but what I do see is that like a man like Joe Fraser, George Fulman, when they come at me with all that force and they miss, they fall in my chest. And then I like rest my hand on them to hold them there <laughs> so they won't do nothing in close. Right. Now, the, and I kind of hold him. I'm holding him. And he's trying to get loose. And that's tiring him, you understand? After six or seven rounds, 
and you're tired, right? It tires you out when the man is holding you trying to fight against him. Oh, no. Yeah, I wish this fellow was still fighting. I don't like what he said. <laughs> you, you didn't was... hold on to Cooper at all. You didn't have Mohammed. a chance to hold on to him. No, he did the second fight. He did? Oh, oh you didn't tell us fight. that. He was like, he was like going to the second fight. I'll tell you something. You all can't well feel. You can one. see the holding, but you can't really feel <laughs> how I'm holding him, see? And I really be holding him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hold him. Mohammed, can I ask you? <laughs> you're, you're carrying that stick all the time now. What is the significance? No, this, I, I just like it. It's nothing. It's just a little cane I picked up. In Zaire. I might not have it tomorrow or nothing. No, it's it's not that. Bad I want to bring in Alan Hubbard at this point because I know you've got a, a, a boxing question to ask uh, Muhammad Alan. Right, Dickie. Uh, Muhammad, as you know, the readers of my magazine have voted you the personality of the decade. Uh, we know that you're the greatest. We're not going <laughs> to argue with that. But how do you prove you're the greatest? If you could pick any heavyweight champion in history, say from Marciano, Joe Louis, back to Jack Johnson, or even John L. Sullivan, who do you think would have given you the toughest fight of them? The toughest sight would be the man who, who's the hardest to knock out, whether he's got a style, and a fellow who had no style, just a bull, was Rocky Marciano. He would be the most trouble, I think. Rocky Marciano. I would have probably knocked out Joe Lewis or uh, some of those fellows because they, have, they were boxers. They took the time, and you could take your time and pick your shots. Marciano just kept coming. He hurt your arms. He could take everything. But what I, came, I cannot prove who or how I would have beat them. But what I can do to prove I'm the greatest of all time, and I'm trying to get it promoted and honest to everything, I believe this is no gimmick. I want Joe Frazier and George Foreman in the same night. Now, you understand? <laughs> I seriously, I want not 15 rounds a piece, because 15 rounds a piece means if it goes the distance of both of them, it means 30 rounds of battle. 30 rounds might be a little too much. But if I had to go 20, I've been 15 about eight times. If I had to go five more, I could train another extra two months. I could go 20 rounds. I want Joe Frazier for 10 rounds. I want uh, 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 Fulmer for 10 rounds. Why Joe Frazier first? Because I think, really, he can take more than Fulmer. He underestimated Fulmer and just got hit with a hard punch. But basically, he can take more than Fulmer, Joe Frazier. He's always getting hit. He keeps coming. This man, Fulmer, is like myself. We're not used to taking a lot of punishment. I probably couldn't take the beating that I put on individuals. I wouldn't take it myself. I would retire if I had to get hit in my pretty face all that long. <laughs> you understand? Now... Henry's still pretty too. He don't look ugly, do he? Some say he's getting prettier all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Leading a bit, but he's yeah. <laughs> Any, Anyway, <laughs> anyway. Uh, what was I talking about? I don't know, but I'm going to bring something else, if I may. No, uh, man, you can't stop me like that. I want to say one thing real well, quick. You would you have uh, gone out of boxing if you'd uh, been hit so, so often as that. Yeah, we were talking about the greatest fighters of <laughs> all right, time. You I want both of them in one night. I want Frazier first and Fulmer second. And then right after I'm finished Frazier, whether I decision him or knock him out, I want George Fulmer to jump right in the ring. And I got three governments who might promote the fight. A place called Estonia, Russia, for contact us, uh, <laughs> Iran, and China. If I have to take him to the communist country, I want both of them in one night because they still got excuses. George Fulman's complaining. <laughs> Do you know the way I whooped that man? Would you believe that they want to still make excuses? The ropes were too loose. That's why. He... <laughs> have you ever heard anything like it? Like the ropes was hitting him. <laughs> the rope, the canvas, the count was too, too slow. <laughs> of uh, the uh, the uh, rope canvas was too soft. And ain't that something? We stayed in the corner. And if it was a lot of dancing and moving and he couldn't catch me, you could say maybe the camera's too soft. He sunk, he made him slow. But we stood still the whole fight, so the cameras couldn't bother him. And as hard as his head hit that floor, he should be glad the cameras were soft. <laughs> you said that you're the prettiest, and you've been saying it for a long time, and I don't think anyone disp <laughs> disputes that. It's very important you being pretty, isn't it, uh, Mohammed? I know Rachel's got a point that she no, wants no. to ask you. On I this don't. Point. Let's get it straight now. I'm not pretty. I'm handsome. <laughs> <laughs> don't say I'm pretty now. Men don't call themselves pretty. Well, I, well, th I think you're pretty and handsome, and I don't know what's happening after the show, but um, <laughs> I'm married, ma'am. Yes, yeah, so am I. So that's two. Yeah. But do you think that um, <laughs> would you have been so great if you hadn't have been so pretty? <laughs> this is really something. This is going too far. <laughs> <laughs> They're so pretty. <laughs> well, you said it yourself. No, I just say that to make people mad. They come to see me get beat up, but I don't really, <laughs> I don't really think I'm pretty. I know I'm pretty. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, but the question is, would you have been so successful if you hadn't been so handsome? I don't know. I think if I looked like Joe Frazier, I wouldn't care. I'd just keep walking in the punches like he do. <laughs> <laughs> See, Joe Frazier, he's so ugly, his face should be donated to the Bureau of Wildlife. <laughs>
let's get another lady in on this one. Bera Gibbons over here has a question to ask you on computerization, actually, Mohammed. Um, Go on, Beryl. Mohammed, you was computerized about three or four years ago, and uh, you came about number six. Do you think it was fair they computerized you? Six what? Um, six in line. In line on the computer. The computerization said you were six, six of one line of what? All time great heavyweights. And do you think it was fair that they computerized you I while you were acting? I don't care. I, don't how do you I didn't know that until you told me. I don't pay no attention to what they say about me. All I do is just do what I have to do and get paid and that's it. But I don't really pay no attention to the rules of boxing. I don't pay no attention. I defy all the rules. I defy, I've added pages to the book of boxing. I have this game as such a thing now until boxing promoters can no longer afford my shows. I have governments like Iran ready to put up 10 million for me to fight Joe Frazier. I have governments like Cairo, Egypt want to put up six million with people like Ron Lyle. I have countries all like uh, all back throughout Zaire talking to Mobuto. He wants him back again. They'll put up five more million for return with Fullman. When we talk about ten million and six million and four million, this is unbelievable. And they don't expect to get the money back. They're promoting their countries and their ideals. So I've like sales so in this sport of boxing until Madison Square Garden is too small. Yankee Stadium is too small. The Houston Astrodome, the biggest promoters and the wealth is Americans and Englishmen you can get for promotions cannot just promote me no more. You understand? So I've not only added pages to boxing, but I added new sections to the boxing book. Now, may I uh, interrupt you there? Because I know there are a lot of questions to be asked. Can I just bring Colin Hart, who's a, a sporting journalist? To um, all of us who've covered your fights in America know very well the effect that you have on the black people of America and they, they travel from uh, coast to coast to see you. Have you ever seriously considered entering politics when your boxing career is over to perhaps help them even further? Or have you had any serious well, offers I would, to if I politics? enter politics, you know, what you're saying, I know is a good question asked with the best of intent. But if I was in politics, then I, it looks, I couldn't help them. See, when I'm sitting in a, a white man's office, which it would be you know, building a White House or a city hall with the American flag over my head, then I can't say things I'm saying now. You understand? Mm -hmm. Then I have to represent the people. It's all, we don't need him as the mayor. He's a bad senator. He's talking about the black people. See, God bless a child that has his own. Charity starts first at home. All I want to do, we have dope problems. We have black people, every Saturday and Friday night, weekend nights, black people fighting each other. 27 black people died in Chicago three weeks ago. 27 died in fighting in nightclubs over women because they hate one another. 27 died. We have, we need a teaching from a God, a man from God, to teach him to love himself, to desire to want to be with himself, to want to help himself, to quit cutting the flesh and blood of his people, quit being violent, period. Let's unite. Let's love one another. We're brothers. This is what we need. Not uh, If we don't respect ourselves, nobody respect us. I can't talk this in politics, see? So when I'm a representative of Allah, God, who's been appointed by Elijah Muhammad, no white man in City Hall had to give me license. You know, I'm talking some bold talk over here. Every American out here hearing it can go back and tell the president, he'll say, if he's talking about Elijah Muhammad, be quiet. We've been in America 42 years, the Muslims. Nobody attack us. They know we right. They just don't want the masses to hear this. That's why we got white women today in America coming after black people more so than ever. There's never been a day in America where so many white women were in black neighborhoods. See, the black power's coming out. Here's a brother right here. He's affected. He's not even from America. Look at his hair. He's been affected by the black man in America, his African hairstyle. This is gradually coming out, but it's going to hit America first. It's got to come there first before these people be free. So what I'm saying is, uh, I don't forget your question, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think you asked it very adequately. Julie, can I bring you in uh, for your question very quickly? Julie Welsh. I forget your question. Yeah, um, you've told us you've received enormous financial offers from, say, Estonia in Russia and in Red China to fight there. Would you fight in a country no, to which the you offers, were... No, the, the money offers didn't come from those countries, just the offers to fight there. But yeah, uh, well, it, the question still figures. Would mm -hmm. you fight in a country to which you were politically opposed? say one which had a very unattractive attitude towards the black man. Oh, like America? <laughs> <laughs>
Well, Next question. I'll fight in America. I'll yeah. fight anywhere. <laughs> Ain't no Next place question. worse than America to black people. <laughs> no, I think it is a valid question, Mohammed. What about South Africa? Supposing you had a massive offer, say $20 million to fight Joe Bugner in South Africa. I'll go to South Africa for nothing. So on the conditions how I go. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm not going to be with no white people. I admire them for wanting to stay white. And I want to stay black. So I'm not angry because of that. I don't like the injustice as far as the bad living, uh, inadequate living. Because that's not my business to get in another country's affair. So I can't go over there preaching like I would in the States. But there's so many beautiful people in South Africa who love Muhammad Ali, who can't get out of the country if they want it. And I owe it to them to go shake their hands, to pick up the babies, to walk with them, to stay there for two weeks, just get calm and let them get used to me and see me. I don't, I don't have nothing in South Africa for that. You understand? And I wouldn't dare go over there. So, well, I'm the champ of the world, and you mean I can't walk over here? Even if they did let me walk over there, eat over there, sleep over there, and I can't do it comfortable knowing I'm just a hand-picked one. I would, if I go to South Africa, I'd stay in one of the little huts, you understand? I'd let them cook me some good old African food, and I'll hang out with just them. So if I was going to fight in South Africa for 20 million or even nothing, and there was an arena there, then they'll just have to give them justice for that day and let them have a this side. I wouldn't want no integration at the arena. I want all the Africans to sit on this side and all the whites and sit on that side and have a little rope that would not about nobody and fight. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Because let me tell you something. If you have any colleges here where black people go to college, have an assembly or something and watch and see all the Jamaicans or the Trinidadians or West Indians. They're just naturally hewn together. Everybody likes to do this own. You see some blue birds going this way, red birds flying this way. They might get all mixed up, but they'll all come out together. <laughs> and you see the tigers with the tigers, the monkeys with the monkeys, the lions with the lions, the giraffes with the giraffes. They're all animal cats, but they got different hangouts. You see the eagles <laughs> over here, the pigeons over here, the buzzards over here, the, the, the all type blue birds, the red birds, the owls. They're all the birds, but they got different little cultures. You got your English talking, your English food, and you and the man in Germany us both brothers, but your cultures are different. You and the man in Russia are even more different yet. I was in Zaire, home of my brothers, but the food and the way to talk, the way to dance, I was one, I'm not home till I get back to Harlem to the brothers. Yeah, baby, I can't stand it. Yeah. See, so, you understand? So ain't nothing wrong with wanting to be with your own kind. What's wrong with me wanting to be with my kind? You understand? I was at the Q Club the other night. I, I was stopped at Talk of the Town, but I wasn't really comfortable. The things they were saying were from Europeans and the dances and the white girls and all that was a nice little day, but it wasn't my culture. I went to the Q Club, you understand, where all the black folks hang out, and they was getting it, doing the James Brown, can't stand the baby. Hey, I was more at home there. I don't hate nobody, but I just like to be with the colored folks. Mohammed, well, I mean, man, just yeah, before so. I ask you a question, your stick is holding up the microphone at the moment, so that's great. So I don't mind going to Africa, you know, yeah. just because they like to be with their own kind. That's a good place to be. I just like to see them have better conveniences. Let's bring, let's bring in, uh, some more people to ask questions. Frank, I know you want to really get bad at boxing. Can we ask a question from you? Please? Boxing <laughs> means nothing. When you look, when you're talking to Muhammad Ali, you're not talking to just a boxer. But I know you want we to can talk, talk to things more interesting than boxing. Anything, but I know I he wants to boxing. ask you a question, Muhammad. It, wasn't, really really a, it wasn't entirely about boxing, actually, Muhammad. That's um, what I know. That's what I was trying to tell you. See? <laughs> <laughs> it's a mind reader. Mind reader. Um, <laughs> I think we've all accepted, and you've certainly proved, that you could probably almost certainly beat any heavyweight in the world today. Probably. See, he still ain't convinced. He said, I've proved that I probably could beat him. You, well, there I've might be someone you can whoop any man in the, on the planet. There might be someone you haven't met yet. We haven't heard of yet. You also probably well, proved possible. that you could beat any heavyweight <laughs> of any time. But um, has it ever occurred to you, and if it hasn't, uh, could you think about it? How do you think it might go in a boxing ring with boxing gloves against uh, a different type of opponent, say an all-in wrestler or a karate man? I have Had you offer. thought about it? I have an offer. <laughs> I cannot tell you the name. I cannot mention this place. No, but there is a karate man they're trying to get me in the ring with. Well, no one is ranked. And, but he's going to have gloves on his feet and gloves on his hands. And, and they asked me, will I fight? I, yeah. And he cannot hit me below the belt, kick me or nothing. He can kick, but not below the belt. And he cannot, uh, no, nothing around the neck. And we're working on that now. And I will eat him up. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm just trying to continue with that vein, uh, Ken. I just want a chance to grab him. I, I asked him, can I have one thing? Can you can grab I, him, too? Yeah, I can grab his legs. If I catch him, throw him down, anything. <laughs> hit him when he's down, anything. <laughs> he can hit me when I'm down. We're working on it. Do you think that'll be a try? No, you're smiling when you say it. But does it, does it I, honest, I'm telling the truth. I would tell you if I was joking. This is serious. Yeah. We're working on it now. Yeah. <laughs>And I pretend, and Jerry Quarry hit me, Bobby Foss hit me, yeah. and I was like, right. And they said, no, you're not tricking me. You're just trying to make me slip in. That's what yeah. they're thinking, playing possum. Right. But I was really hit. But if I had acted normal, it would have looked too genuine. So I was hit so hard, my toes were shaking <laughs> until I saw I'm in trouble. So I just, I said, I'm going to put a little emphasis. Uh, you know, and they laid back to see if I'm really hurt that bad. You had a question up there, fellow in red. Well, I know that Ed's got one that comes on from the Stuart over here, Mohammed. Um, could you clear up, Mohammed, the time against Sonny Liston when you said that there was stinging in your eyes? What happened? He looked like a Kennedy, don't he? <laughs> a kid? Kennedy. 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 Oh, Kennedy. Yeah. Well, I'm not. <laughs> okay, well, stinging what? You know, you. Oh, Sonny Liston. Sonny Liston, you said your eyes were stinging. Uh, yeah. What happened there? I'm going to tell you something. You hear about the crooked element in boxing? I'm going to tell you another truth, honest to God truth. A fella came to my gymnasium about uh, a week before I left Zaire. He said, do you want to win that fight in Zaire? I said, yeah, I'm going to win. Well, I got something there's no way for you to lose. I said, what? He said, little gangster cat had his hat turned up. He's well known in the New York area. His name's been in the news. I won't say nothing. He came up to me, honest to God. He said, he said, he had a little stuff in a bottle. He said, you see this. <laughs> yes, had turned down, about 70 years old, a little gangster fellow, you know. All I can say is he was Italian. And he, I'm married to what? Yeah, well, yeah, but she's not a gangster. This is a gangster. He said, he said, you take this, if you should get in trouble, rub this on your gloves. You can't see it, you can't smell it. It's hot. But, and then when you just jab him, as soon as you touch him and the first bit of perspiration and the, just the heat, for, it won't blind him or hurt him for good, but for a few minutes, this man will actually not be able to see. And you use this if you have to. I took it. I said, okay. I wasn't going to use it. wouldn't think about that. God would punish me even think about something like that. I don't, I'm winning my face honestly. I don't do that. Anyway, I still got the bottle. But the same fellow was in Liston's corner the night that happened to me. <laughs> and the same fellow <laughs> is real tight with Jack Nylon, the Liston people. The same fellow. I can't say no names or nothing. You never guess who he is. <laughs> but now, show you how he's about 70 years old, but he must have he must have forgotten because he did that to me. And he I could have popped him in the nose or had him arrested or anything. So, so that's what happened to me. Because you remember when the Liston fight, I, for one round, I couldn't hardly see. I was holding my hand out. Were you at that fight, Reg? Yeah. And I really couldn't see. I just cleared up for some reason. Okay. And, and that must be what they used on me because it didn't happen to the fifth round after I got Liston in trouble. They put that same thing on me. Nobody's ever asked you to throw a fight, Mohammed. You're not saying it the other way. Nobody's asked you to lose it. No, not like that. They just trying to give me some gimmicks to win, but I wouldn't accept that. Terry Mancini, Terry Mancini. 
Um, Professional footballer in the back there, Mohammed. Football? Yeah. Football, he still man. play? Yes, he does. <laughs> Ball head man playing football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Henry, uh, cool Henry put you on the floor when he was uh, a bald headed man. I'm sure he is. <laughs> Who said, who said that? Who said that? <laughs> he did that same, same guy. Nice. Yeah. I'll see you um, after the show. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I agree. Everything that people write about you, although I don't agree with the press a lot of the times, um, you're the greatest, tremendous, great Thank showman, you. marvellous. You I'm said earlier man. that you uh, you can't fill, they can't fill Yankee Stadium or the Houston Astrodome. They can't what? They can't fill it. I mean, what, I mean, what, sorry, they can fill it and they can fill it twice over. But... Um, your pre-fight, your pre-fight uh, build-ups, um, when you go to the weigh-in and you have, or they appear, mock-up battles with the other opponent. Are they really? How much is that is towards the uh, well, promotion really of the fight? Well, I'm not really wanting to fight there because I wouldn't be paid. But I really <laughs> do be angry. I have to psych myself up. I put myself on spots. I say... Is this for press, so um, for the build, for the build-up yes, for the well, fight? not really because the evening of the fight is when that happens and it's really sold out by them. But it actually puts fear in your opponent, like George Foreman. Just before the fight, I'm looking at him when the man's giving his instructions. I said, Sucker, you are in trouble tonight. You are fighting the greatest fight of all times. You heard I was the greatest, like you just said, you heard this, now you see it. I said, you said I was the greatest, but you're going to see. I'm fast, sucker. I'm going to burn you up. You were fighting your idol. When you were a little kid, you were hearing about me, you know. And he was. He wasn't even fighting. He didn't have his first fight in 1969. I'd been ex exiled two years after all I'd done. He just started fighting. So when I was fighting people like you in the 60s, he was just a little kid in junior high school. I said, you're meeting your man. Master, your idol. He looked at me. And then I went back, first round, I laid in the corners, right? I said, come on, show me something. I talked through the whole fight. I don't know if you all know it. I talked through the whole fight. I said, come on, sucker. I said, show me something. They told me you could hit hard. You're just a sissy. Come on, sucker. Show me something. Come on, you can do better than that, George. You want to corner me? Here I am. You're waiting to corner me? And he just, ooh, ooh. And every once in a while, I just go, <laughs> See, the quickest way to a point is a straight line. To hit me, he had to do that. Uh, uh, and while he's doing that, I said, I'm tagging him with jabs, right? Pop, pop. He's a fighter, you know? Whenever you meet a man coming at you like that, don't worry about it. Don't duck like he's so powerful. Just pop him. Pop. See? See, he's going. I done hit him before he got to you. <laughs> He, he's sticking one in. What else did you say to him, Alan? What else did you say to him? Oh, I grabbed his head sometimes, and I said, look at you, look at you. Round seven, and you're tired. You have eight more rounds to go. Come on, keep punching. I want you to get tired. I said, uh-oh. I said, this is the wrong place to get tired. This is the wrong place to get tired. And he's just throwing them. I said, and then he got a couple of bruises. If you notice his face is kind of swollen. I said, look at you. You're the world heavyweight champion. You're the world. Pop, I'm hitting him. Pop, you're the world heavyweight champion. And look at me. You can't. Pop, I hit you. Just say, watch out. Here come another one. Pop, I said, look at that. Look at that. He threw it in there. I said, come on, come on, get me. I'm going back to the rope now. I laid back. I said, okay, take your best shot. Take your best shot. <laughs> He's breathing. I said, oh, oh, you finished, boy. You are in trouble. I said, you don't have but two chances, slim and none. You're in trouble. I talked to him through the whole fight. Did anyone ever talk, talk back to you? Talk? Just to say, um, go on. No, did you want to say something about you? He didn't say one word back to me. Yeah, I just want to ask a question, you know. Uh, as a heavyweight, you're, you're much faster than any other heavyweight. I'd like to know if you've always been, if it's always been the same, when you know, when you say light heavyweight and middleweight. Yeah, and I was way, fast as then, right. Much mm. faster than I'm now. Yeah. Mm. I'm still pretty fast, but I preserve my energy. I could come out dancing and hopping like I did when I was 21, mm -hmm. but I don't know how long I could do it. And if I do it, it might take too much out of me for the distance. From here on out, you won't see a real dance in Muhammad Ali. Right. You'll see me using my strength and my power. I'll be laying on the ropes, and I'll be letting my men take the best shots. Like you said, people realize I can take a punch now. But they always wondered if I could because I never let them see. You understand? So didn't you wonder? That, <clears throat> didn't I wonder? Whether you could? You wonder what'll happen one day if, you know, if you fly a lot, right? <coughs> you yeah. fly. Yeah. Have you ever thought about sometime, what will we do Only if something, taking off. something happened, you know? How would I do? You never hope it'd happen. <laughs> but, you know. Mohammed, I want to bring Neil Dennis Smith in here. You want to ask a question about poetry, I think, Neil? Yeah, <laughs> I've always been a great admirer of your ability as, your, as a poet. 
Um, have you had to work hard at it, or is it just sheer genius? It comes to me. It comes to me naturally. And I do it mainly because of my fights, uh, little simple rhymes. I just wrote a poem the other day entitled Truth. It says, the face of truth is open, the eyes of truth are bright, the lips of truth are ever closed, the head of truth is upright, the breast of truth stands forward, the gaze of truth is straight, truth has neither fear nor doubt, truth has patience to wait, the words of truth are touching, the voice of truth is deep, the law of truth is simple, all you sow you reap. The soul of truth is flaming, the heart of truth is warm, the mind of truth is clear and firm through rain and storm. Facts are only its shadow. Truth stands above all sin. Great be the battle of life. Truth in the end shall win. The image of truth is the cross. Wisdom's message is its rod. The sign of truth is Christ, and the soul of truth is God. Life of truth is eternal. Immortal is its past. Power of truth shall endure. Truth shall hold to the last. That's a masterpiece. Now, did you... Uh, <laughs> did, did you... Don't need my hand. Did you think that up or did you have to I'll, write it down? Did it come from here? No, yes, but I had to write, not, not just straight out. It took me about a week or two to get it together. Let's look to the future, if we may, Muhammad. You've said that you want to get uh, Foreman and Fraser in the same ring, ten rounds each, but let's move beyond that. You, I think you've also said that you would certainly retire after four years. Do you see that? You know, I said three or four times I want to retire. I want to quit saying I'm going to retire because I don't want to be a man that looks like you're lying or you just, or you don't, your word is no good. I don't know what I'm going to do. I want to retire after this one, but I found out talking to the African presidents, I, I was at the Revol Independence Revolution mm. anniversary in Zaire. I talked about 20 African presidents and a couple of uh, those who are fighting for independence in the bush, in the jungles and stuff. And we talked, and I'm so surprised to find out that every one of those presidents, they knew me, they knew my history, and they all want me to come to their country, and all their people want me to come to the country. And I found out through boxing I can do so much to help so many people, and our people in the States. And for me to give up and to get out of the public and go somewhere and cut the grass and lay off at this time when the world is struggling and so much I can do would be terrible. And through boxing, like Zaire is a country we never heard of in America. I don't know if you all heard much about the average man. Now everybody know about Zaire. Since when it was the Belgium, Congo, we all knew, but very few people know about Zaire. So I think there's so much I can do by continuing fighting. We're trying to build a hospital, Elijah Muhammad, our religious group in Chicago. We have the land that's going to take $100 million, a 300-bedroom hospital. Our people are dying in hospitals because they're too crowded, all kind of problems. You know, you go to a hospital in a lot of countries and places, and your man is sitting with his guts hanging out. He just got hit in a car, and it's a bad thing to see that all the doctors are busy. This man bleeding to death, and guts are hanging out. And the doctors are busy working on another man got shot in the head. A case just as important. It's a bad thing, you know. So I want to do something to help humanity. And through boxing, I can do a lot. And I'm going to try to get one of these $10 million purses donated to something like the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I don't want one quarter. You understand? I would rather give the $10 million to the hospital than to get even $7 million for myself and give the government three. I'd rather have the whole $10 million to go to the hospital. Let's look at, to the future for a young man who's come <coughs> to see you. He badly wanted to come to see you. His name is Isaac Fleming. He's a young boxer. Isaac, come down and say hello to Mohammed. Do you mind? He being... box? He boxes. What he box? Cigars, oranges, grapefruit? <laughs> <laughs> see how he shapes up. What? Me and him go through? No, but just look at him and see what, oh, he, what, kind, of, what kind of box he's going to show. Well, he looks like he's built like Sugar Ray Robinson. He's not muscly. See, you watch he's these... He's only 17. You're a 17. You, you right? watch these kind of men. When a guy comes up with big old muscles, like George Fullman, you understand? Mm -hmm. And that means he's tight and he's like... Oh, oh. But men like this are like... Real fast, you understand? Let me see left jab. Jab. No, man. Ball <laughs> your fist up and throw a left jab. Jab it. No, man. No, he ain't, he has, he's not going to be no fighter the way he's punching now. He now needs a whole lot of training. See? Come on, you're frightened? Don't be frightened, brother. Where are you from? Jamaica. Jamaica. Hold your hands up and block my jab. How do you block this? Come on. Come on, show me something. You ain't nothing. Show me something. You and you tired already. Look at you, son. I'm hitting you already. You ain't got nothing. All the girls are watching. I'm beating you up. Come on. Yeah, he's pretty good. He's pretty good. He's pretty good. Thank you very much.
Yeah, my friend, you are not as dumb as you look. <laughs>